here we are, and it's 3 o'clock on the dot. Um, I'm rarely so prompt, but thank you all for being here and coming out on kind of a gloomy day. Um, welcome, everyone, to Kaiser Health News, uh, our panelists, the audience, um, and everyone else. Um, and I mean both of the, both those people who are here in the room and those who are joining us via Facebook Live, which we're also doing uh, simultaneously with this program. Um, I'm Elizabeth Rosenthal. I'm the editor-in-chief of Kaiser Health News. It's a wonderful organization, an organization which, um, unlike most news organizations today, is growing and growing fast, which is good news for us. Um, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan, editorial, independent program of the Kaiser Family Foundation. And I always have to point out we have no relationship to Kaiser Permanente or Kaiser Health Systems, for those of you who don't know who we are. Um, we tackle um, the multitude of topics that impact America's health, large and small. Our work appears um, in a wide range of partners from the New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, to um, PBS, NPR, and all the way over to uh, BuzzFeed and the Daily Beast. So we're, we're cool, too. <laughs> um, uh, and this week, I just want to toot our horn a little bit here. You may have seen uh, a bunch of our stories. There was a story on the uh, for-profit hospice care industry that appeared in Time and on uh, PBS, a project on uh, the urine testing for opioids and how much money that uh, is generating to some uh, physicians and uh, private companies uh, that appeared in Bloomberg, an NPR story on the undertreatment of sickle cell disease, and a story on the profits from Medicaid in California the, uh, that appeared in the LA Times, and that's just to name a few. So. Um, you won't know us from the top of the story, but if you read to the end, and you should always read to the end of newspaper stories, it will say uh, uh, that this is a product of uh, Kaiser Health News or a partnership with Kaiser Health News. So I, I like to say our brief is healthcare, and we cover everything that's important in healthcare and a health policy. But we do have a few topic areas um, to which we devote extra attention, partly because we feel like they're undercovered uh, in the, the, the range of media outlets today, partly because, um, you know, they, you don't sell ads against them. So, um, and since we're a nonprofit, we don't care about that. We just want to do what's right. Um, so anyway, uh, we, um, one of those areas is, is why we're here today, uh, the care of older adults and how health system issues affect this population. Um, it's an area where we have a team working on th this topic uh, basically 24-7. And that's why we're here. We're here to talk about a topic that will affect every American as they approach the end of life, advanced directives. Um, I trained as a doctor many years ago when advanced directives were first kind of percolating around and they seemed like a no-brainer, but here we are 30 years later. Um, and there are a bunch of perplexing questions surrounding these documents that I hope our panelists will help us answer. One is why they're so underutilized by patients. Um, uh, Jonelle Alicia, who's, who's going to be moderating the panel, mentioned that um, she did a story yesterday about how uh, about half of of workers in a hospice program who, who encountered these issues day after day um, didn't have advanced directives themselves. So why don't people have them? And the second one is why aren't they respected when people do have them? Um, why aren't they respected by families, by medical providers who are charged with carrying them out? Why are they so often ignored when people do go to the trouble to have them? So I think the big question we're asking today is how can we make this good idea function more effectively in practice? And I hope you all will um, have some ideas about that. Uh, like many of our stories here at KHN, I hope this panel will provide some insights for you all, some practical guidance for all of us who are trying to make this work. 
And um, I hope also that that uh, we are an organization that thrives on community and participation. So I hope you all in the audience will, um, as we get into Q and A, share your experiences and your questions. Um, I'd like to introduce now, for a few words, um, Ronnie Snyder, who's the program director of the John Hay a Hartford Foundation, which. Um, Thank you, Ronnie. I don't even know where you are here. There you are. Oh, you're, too, you're so close. Um, fund some of our work in this area and, and other issues. It's really been an invaluable source of funding for us to uh, explore these issues, which maybe the mainstream um, ad-driven media can't or doesn't uh, deal with enough. Um, Ronnie uh, is the program director of the John A. Hartford Foundation. She has a master, a master's degree in public administration, health care policy from NYU, uh, a doctorate um, in health services research from UCLA, and has done a lot of work for her entire career in this issue of um, improving the health of older adults. And so I'm going to turn it over to her now to say a few words, and then we'll get on with our panel. Thanks, everyone, for being here. This is a really exciting event for us. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Libby. Thank you for the introduction and also for the excellent work that uh, Kaiser Health News does every day, which we're so proud to support. So I'm Ronnie Snyder. As Libby mentioned, I'm the program director at the John A. Hartford Foundation. It's my great privilege. It is a job that I love because our mission, improving care for older adults, is something I feel really passionately about. And today's discussion is incredibly relevant. Uh, it's important to our mission. And understanding the importance of advanced care planning and navigating the medical and the legal and the ethical landscapes of end-of-life care is incredibly important to each and every one of us, especially as we age. The John A. Hartford Foundation is a private philanthropy. We are national in scope. It was established in 1929 by two brothers, John and George Hartford. Uh, they were both um, owners uh, and at different times CEOs of the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. You'll know that as A&P Groceries. And they wanted their foundation to make a big impact. In fact, they wanted to us to work on areas where there was great need and great potential. So we see great need and great potential in the 10,000 people every day in the United States who are turning 65. These older Americans are making really vital contributions to our society also every day. So, but often, as we know, our healthcare system and other sectors as well are not really meeting the needs of older Americans. And as a result of that, the care of older Americans frequently falls short. Services can be duplicated. Frequently, there is poor communication, poor coordination, and older patients sometimes are harmed by that as well. So all too frequently, older adults are excluded from their own healthcare decisions and their goals and preferences, and the things that matter most to all of us as patients often go unexplored, sometimes even ignored. So we have the opportunity to change that. And today, the Johnny Hartford Foundation is building on our now more, more than 35 years of experience to spread various models of care that meet the needs of older adults to improve outcomes and also to cut costs. So we, we focus our work in three different areas, age-friendly health systems, supporting the needs of family caregivers, and also transforming care for people with serious illness or facing the end of life, the topic that we're here to discuss today. It's a tremendously important topic because right now there are too many people who aren't getting care that matches those goals and preferences. They aren't dying where or in a way that they wish to. They aren't getting things like pain management, spiritual or family support as needed. And that's why for decades now we've supported the practice and the spread of palliative care. And more recently, we brought together six of the leading innovators in serious illness and end-of-life care to scale up uh, change more broadly, nationally, from improving cl uh, clinic clinician training to helping people at their kitchen tables discuss and document their own wishes. So the group it, the, itself, those six I mentioned, include organizations like the Center to Advance uh, Palliative Care, CAPC, 
Vital Talk, the Ariadne Lab Serious Illness Care Program, the Conversation Project, the National Pulse Paradigm, and Respecting Choices, a part of the uh, CTAC, the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care, which is represented here today. So we know that we also need better connection between the healthcare system and the legal profession. And that's why we at the Johnny Hartford Foundation recently awarded a grant to the American Bar Association, which is going to partner with the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine to convene experts and to produce guidelines that will have actionable tools to help people better prepare for their final years. And you're going to hear from Charlie Sabatino today, who is working on that project. I note these activities because I hope that all of you in the audience will view the John A. Hartford Foundation and its grantees as well as a resource for the work that you're doing. You're here because you're interested and because you're invested. And we want to be a resource for changing practice and policy around palliative care and also around improving the care of older adults more broadly. So finally, I really want to acknowledge the very important role of Kaiser Health News in advancing our mission. Uh, we partnered with KHN to support an incredible reporting desk that is focused on topics related to improving care of older adults. Every week, their really top-notch journalists are producing important news coverage on issues around aging and health. So we're ple super pleased that as part of that project, they can extend their reporting to events like this. It helps to further our conversations uh, we all need to have these conversations in order to find solutions and move the needle in improving care for older people, which in turn enriches all of our lives and makes our communities stronger. So my thanks goes to KHN, to all of the panelists we're so happy to have here, and to everyone in the audience for participating today and for giving your truly valuable time. Uh, every one of you, every one of us in this room is crucial to improving uh, healthcare, to influencing healthcare policy and practice, you can help pull those levers of change. And I hope that after today's discussion, you'll be inspired to do even more of that. Together, we know that we can change the status quo. We can create a society where older adults are valued, where older adults are cared for, and where we can continue their and ultimately all of our vital contributions. So thank you very much. Libby. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, I'm Janelle Alicia. I'm a health uh, reporter here at Kaiser Health News, and I cover issues related to end of life care and aging. And recently, I have been writing an awful lot of stories about advanced directives, and so that's why I'm moderating today. Uh, let me introduce our panel quickly so that we can get into our conversation that I know you're all eager to have. So to my far left, we have Thaddeus Mason Pope, who is director of the Health Law Institute and a professor of law at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul. His focus is using the law to both improve medical decision making and to protect the rights of patients at the end of life. He is the co-author of the treaties, The Right to Die, The Law of End of Life Decision Making, and he runs the Medical Futility blog. For those of you who haven't had a chance to see it, it's fabulous, uh, which tracks developments in end of life care. Uh, just yesterday, he was co-author of a piece in the journal JAMA Internal Medicine about the use of advanced directives in people with dementia and uh, terminal illness. Interesting. Uh, next, we have Judy Schwartz. Uh, Judy has been the clinical director of End of Life Choices New York and its predecessor organization, Compassion and Choices, since 2002. She has counseled hundreds of patients suffering from incurable and progressive or terminal illnesses and their families about end of life choices and options. She's recently focused on the option of voluntarily stopping eating and drinking as a means of a peaceful, patient-controlled death and become concerned about the need to complete advanced directives by those newly diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Next, we have Marianne Grant. She is Senior Regulatory Advisor for the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care that we heard about earlier and a Palliative Care Nurse Practitioner at the University of Maryland Medical Center. She has served on the board of the Hospice and Palliative Nurses Association, been faculty for End of Life Nursing Education Consortium, and she speaks nationally and internationally on palliative care issues. Uh, 
She's also had a personal experience with a health system's failure to honor an advanced directive, and we're hoping to hear about that today, too. And finally, uh, we have Charlie Sabatino. He is the director of the American Bar Association's Commission on Law and Aging, where since 1984, as senior attorney and then as director, he has been responsible for the ABA Commission's policy research, project development, technical assistance, and education in areas that include health and long-term care, guardianship and capacity issues, surrogate decision-making, and end-of-life care. He is a fellow and former president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center, and a legal advisor to the National Pulse Paradigm Task Force. So welcome to all of our panelists. Um, you can see that all of our speakers have experience and expertise regarding advanced directives, and we're going to delve into many of the um, issues relevant to that in this hour. Um, but first, uh, let me let me do something that I know our experts do usually when they're talking to groups. Um, but a show of hands, how many of you out there have a written advanced directive for your end of life wishes? Huh? So, me, me too. Um, that looks pretty good. I imagine many of you are are um, uh, interested in this. So so that's better um, than at the average in the U.S., which, as we know, only about a third of Americans have advanced directives. Um, how many here have talked with their loved ones about end of life wishes? See far more, which is which is also reflective. And then, have anyone has anyone in here um, been the loved one carrying out the wishes? of someone who died, a much more difficult situation. So, you know, we know this issue affects all of us um, and will affect all of us at some time, and so that's why it's so important. Um, so let's, let's start. We have to start with the basics, and so I think I want to ask Thad first. Um, Thad, can you tell us what is an advanced directive and who should have one? Well, the, uh, every adult should have an advanced directive. I think that's easy. So what is it? It's a, it's a two-part document um, authorized legally in every state. There's an instructional part where you can appoint somebody normally called an agent who can make health care decisions on your behalf if you don't have the capacity to do that for yourself. And that's normally thought to be the more important part of the advanced directive. And then the other part of the advanced directive is, is the instructional part, formerly known as a living will, where you would actually get into some specific preferences, what sorts of health care interventions you do want and what sorts of health care interventions you don't want. Right. And, and every adult should have one. So, so uh, your 18-year-old kid, uh, son, child should as well. I think a lot of people don't, don't think about that. Um, as we said, we know about one-third of Americans overall have advanced directives. Um, it's interesting, though, uh, even among people older than 65, only about 58% have written directions if they fall seriously ill, according to a new Kaiser um, Family Foundation poll that was done last week. And we're doing better than we were in the 1990s, um, from, from what we know, when less than 20% of people had these documents. Um, but I'm wondering, can we talk about the barriers? Why so few people have them? Um, I guess I'll ask Charlie first and then the rest of you. Well, just to follow up on your figures, uh, we do know that uh, the frequency does increase uh, with age. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the barriers is that younger people don't think that this is something relevant to them. Uh, as, as Thad said, everybody should have an advanced directive, but it's a different process at different stages of your life. If you're 20-something, uh, you, you, may, you may still think that you're uh, immortal and, and not uh, uh, susceptible to death, uh, but you can at least envision that you could have a bicycling accident that knocks you out of commission for a while, which I had that experience myself. And, um, and somebody's got to make decisions for you, at least on a temporary basis. Mm -hmm. So the focus for a younger person who who's, would want to be cured of everything they can think of is at least to get that, uh, uh, that agent appointed. When you're, when you're middle-aged, although not necessarily chronologically, but you know, at a stage when you're dealing with chronic illnesses, like many of us are, that, were, that are fairly stable, you're, you're really thinking of long-term stability, but you still need to think about who's the best agent. And when you get at an advanced stage of illness, you're, you're starting to uh, see what's going to be your ultimate demise, 
and are able to make much more concrete decisions. So it's a different process as you go along, but people kind of think of it as a, as a one, uh, uh, one flavor kind of a action, and a lot of people don't want to deal with that. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering about... Um uh, we wrote a story yesterday about hot workers at a hospice, at a large Florida hospice. And less than half of the workers there had advanced directives. And a lot, part of the, one of the reasons they mentioned was um, fear of the subject and just reluctance to talk about it. Marion, I know this is something CTAC works with a lot, so. Yeah, so I mean, you know, this is not just a rational thing. And um, just think about it. We, as Americans, we're not good at planning for bad things, right? Most of us don't save ret for retirement. Many of us have basements that need to be cleaned out, right? So there, <laughs> there's stuff that we should be doing that we don't do. And we know this is a topic that is not high in anyone's list of fun things to talk about. And it's really kind of strange if you think about it. Most older adults have thought about where they want to be buried. They might, if, like my father-in-law said, I want to be buried in the navy blue suit. So being dead, he could imagine, and he had a will for his property. But how he was going to get from here to there was something he never, ever wanted to talk about. And I think, unfortunately, many people and many patients are in that situation. And we can try as providers to have these conversations. But I wasn't surprised to hear that the hospice workers didn't have mm. advanced directives, because I lecture for nurses all the time. And I ask this question every time. and they sheeplishly don't raise their hand. And I say, you're just complaining to me that wouldn't it make your life as a clinician easier, and yet you don't have them either. So I, I think this is going to be hard to get everybody to do. And, and Judy, I know you see people all the time who come in with very difficult diagnoses. And, and do many of them have directives in place or no? They do. They, they have some kind of something that they've filled out at some time <laughs> um, whether it's actually applicable to their current situation is a whole other thing. Um, what I find more, most often can be extremely challenging is they have appointed the lawyer to be their agent because he's the firstborn and he understands about these things. He's across the country and the other one who's here taking mom to all of the doctor's appointments is not appointed, has no legal role, and yet there was no conversation with everybody in the room, and I am a big believer in you get everybody in the room, and you be sure that everybody's hearing what's being said, and that mom gets a chance to tell everybody what their wishes are. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good point. Um, you know there have been a number of people uh, of efforts, of course, to help people make their wishes known. Um, um, projects like the Five Wishes, the Conversation Project. Um, you know, as I was preparing for this, I heard from someone who said um, her parents were going to fill out the Five Wishes forms, but they were told that it met the technical requirements for an advanced directive in 42 states, but not all the states. So, and, and Charlie, you know about every state. Um, so, how, why, how are the technical requirements so different? And if you're making your wishes known, do you, you have to use the form in that state? How does that work? Well, I underline the term technical, it was oh. what you said there. I, okay. You know, I, I think no matter what you form you use, uh, whether it's on the side of a uh, grocery store bag, if it can be authenticated, uh, the, you know, we have a constitutional and common law right to have those wishes respected. However, because st states in the, starting in the mid-70s decided uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, provide some ways that people could do this, supposedly to help them to do it, uh, by creating these bright line pathways uh, in, in terms of statutory forms. But in, in doing it, uh, we've created many more barriers than we have uh, helps in, in doing this, because uh, in half the states, uh, f first of all, they have a separate living will and, uh, and healthcare power statute, and they're not always quite consistent with what they say. Uh, across all the states, the law is very balkanized, particularly in terms of some of the technical features, such as who, uh, who can be a, a witness, uh, who your agent can be. Uh, and then uh, some make it even harder. They say uh, that your form must be substantially in the form of in the statute. And, we, and nobody's really, there's no, been no case law that has defined what substantial compliance means. So what everybody gets told is, well, the safe thing to do is use the state form which is usually written at a 12th plus grade education mm -hmm. level and doesn't really provide much guidance. Um, 
And, and then some of the requirements are getting even worse. Uh, uh, a few, about five or six states um, have mandatory notices. I call these kind of healthcare Miranda warnings uh, <laughs> that you have to have part of the form. So if you make up a specialized form uh, uh, for a particular you know, uh, group of people, uh, and it doesn't, and this and this standardized disclosure doesn't describe that form. Why would you attach it to your form? Uh, and, and a few states um, uh, even require, such as Indiana, require that if you want to give your agent the authority to uh, withhold life-sustaining treatment, you have to use this these particular words. It's a 169-word paragraph <laughs> written in legalese that you have to put in the form to, to authorize your agent. So we've terribly balkanized the, the law, and um, um, it. it it's a barrier, too, in, in terms of getting people to do advanced directives because they think of this as a legal task that you need legal expertise to do, and they're kind of afraid, eh, I'm not sure which way I should do it. I'll, I'll put that off sometime when I talk to a lawyer. Oh, okay. Because I had a source tell me this week, it's as easy as writing it on a napkin. And, you know... We will take anything. We'll take it. We will, <laughs> right? I, I okay. Will, okay. I see patients in the ICU, and honestly... You know, we're not very fussy about the forms. If somebody can come and make a case for somebody having expressed their wishes, we're going to go with it. Is that okay. the case, though, in the emergency room? You come in with a tissue saying, here's what I want? I'm not well, so in, sure. In the ER, you've got to save everybody. That's you right. Know? So that's, that's right. why I'm talking about yeah. the ICU. Oh, okay, they fine. save you in the Different ICU, situation. and then it's, it, it, they yes. save you in the ER. They'll take everything out in the ICU, but they put everything <laughs> in in the ER. <laughs> Unless you've got the healthcare agent there saying, over my dead, dead body. body. And even then, you need the form to say you're That's the agent. Right. Yeah. That's oh, right. Okay. And so one question that people often have, so I'm from Oregon. I'm here in D.C. this week. If I get hit by a bus, the form I filled out because I set, started covering this beat, um, am, I okay, am I okay? Are people okay state to state? Dad, I'll ask you that. Uh, I hope Charlie agrees with this. Yes. <laughs> Generally, almost all states have a portability provision in the okay. state law saying we, if clinicians in this jurisdiction should recognize an advanced directive from, from another jurisdiction. However, usually there's a, then there's a comma that says, if it's valid in the other jurisdiction. And of course, if you're a DC physician, you have no idea what a valid or, I mean, you, you probably don't know what a valid DC directive looks like, much less a valid Oregon directive. Um, but, but hopefully you guys are right, in which case maybe people aren't that fussy about that technicality. Boy, no wonder that's confusing then for people and why they back away from it. Um, even when we do fill out the forms and we tell our families, um, we know that having an advanced directive is not always enough. This is so interesting to me. I, I really didn't know that there's this vast body of research that shows that surrogates often don't honor the wishes of the patient. Um, they, uh, there's a lot of that. And then there was like this study this summer that found out 80% of the surrogates in this study focus th on their perception of the patient's well-being rather than the patient preferences. Why? Why does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to take this? Um, well, well and I, so, you know, here's our quandary in the hospital. You're not arguing with the patient. You're arguing with the healthcare agent. And you have a sneaking suspicion that they are not actually representing what the patient wanted, but it's the healthcare agent who could sue you. Yep. So th this is where, you know, and, and you tried, these are enormously difficult decisions to make. You know, we are, we are at a point where technology can keep people alive really indefinitely. And if you have a 95-year-old, frail with multiple illnesses, we can keep them going for some amount of time, and so often we have to stop things. And most family members, even though the ethic rule says it's the same, it's not doing harm to them, it's allowing a natural process to proceed, that's not how, not how most families see it. They feel like they're killing their loved one. So these are very difficult decisions, and they're the ones who have to live with the consequences, because honestly, the patient is so sick, it's probably not going to end well anyway. So I think in the hospital, we're, we try to help the families make the right decisions, but sometimes you have to give them much more time then the form would, uh, would tell you they need to come to the right point of view. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that a lot of that problem is created by and therefore it could be solved by the healthcare professionals themselves. In other words, w when they go to the surrogate, the prompt, right, is what do you yes. want yeah. to do for your mother, yeah. which is not the right question right. and it's not the right way to frame it. Yeah. The question should be what would your mother have said about this? Um, and so they're not, um, 
really trained or the surrogate is not really well trained about what their role is here. The, and, and therefore, I think so, a lot of that problem that you identified okay. is is caused by the clinicians. So that might be yeah. um, for for consumers who are thinking about this or families who are thinking about this. If they if they try, it's terribly stressful, of course, but if they tried to keep that in mind, just that question, what would they want? You know, That's very, very hard. Exactly. But and if healthcare and, providers. And the other thing that I think, I, I totally agree with you, Thad. And then, but the next thing is, the consequences of this decision now to continue to treat has has a whole sequela that that's not part of that decision and and yet it should be part of the discussion with that healthcare agent because i bet that person in the bed has some thoughts about it and the question is can you elicit those conversations that happened over time around the kitchen table when other people had these horrible things happen to them and ended up in nursing homes on feeding tubes and all the rest of the things that many people think they would never want for themselves. So, so in addition to asking the right question, you have to sort of step back and be sure that people understand that this is not just one decision you're making now. I'm a big believer in time-limited trials, right? So let's see what happens for X amount of time. We're gonna aggressively see if we can bring dad back to the pre-insult condition. But if not, we're gonna meet again. And then we're gonna have another conversation. And how, I mean, do those convert, does that happen or well, not really? you know, so this is the other challenge. Um, I, I'm, as a palliative care person in the hospital, I'm the only one who has the time to do this. And this is what I get yeah. paid to do. Um, in the ER and the ICU, you don't get paid to do yeah. this. So yeah. oftentimes it's days or weeks into a hospital stay when things are really not going well that we get called in as a palliative care team, which is another plug for why we need to have palliative care sooner. Um, and then I come and start asking these yeah. questions and yeah. the family says, oh my, what do you mean he's not gonna go back to playing golf? Yeah. And I think, yeah. I, he's been here for three weeks. He's not gonna go back to doing anything. Yeah. And, and they, they think he's, he's gonna get all the way better, and no one has had that conversation. So, I mean, there's evidence that if we had those conversations in the hospital every three or four days, people would much sooner make appropriate decisions for their loved ones. I see. They, and, sorry, uh, and just to finish that, if they'd had the conversation at even home, even before they before might not the even crisis, be in the hospital, we wouldn't yes. have this mm -hmm. problem. Right. It, it goes back to the question of, of the whole appointment of a proxy. This concept. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I have uh, uh, talked to people who've been appointed a proxy. But they've never had any discussion. Yeah. It was yeah. as mom or dad said, well, you know what I want. That, you know, yeah. I just named you. So that, and that's it. Um, and because people still have this concept that, OK, I've done the, the form. Yep. It's taken care of. And yep. if, you, if you look at advanced care planning, it's a big circle. And there's a little piece in that circle, this is a Venn diagram, if you imagine <laughs> it, uh, that's, that's the advanced directive form. The rest of it is a relationship. It's discussion. And it's uh, knowing. Uh, a course of the illness. It really is much, much richer than that. And, and people who are named as agents generally have no idea what the job description is. And that's something we haven't done a good job of teaching people. And, um, and so how would we fix that? Um, the idea that, that proxies uh, or surrogates come, you know, when they're called to do this important thing, they have no training, it's like day one, you're in class. So how do we, fi how, how do we fix that? Well, th this is something I did want to follow up on before, so it's a good segue. We, we were talking when we started about how many people have an advanced directive. Right. And I think it's important to recognize that that's only a first step. So that's bad enough, right? As you said, maybe only a third have. And I think Charlie was a co-author on a study that showed that 75% of the people that have advanced directives, they completed one, but they aren't available to the clinicians when that patient is Do you admitted. mean like physically they're locked away yeah, they're or right. you can't find them? Box. Right. right. Okay. So under the Patient Self-Determination Act, the facility has to ask, do you have an advanced directive? And then somebody says, yes. Yeah, where well, is where is it? <laughs> so we don't have it. So, so it exists, but it's not available. Okay. Um, and so, so one problem is people, what they, they complete it, and they, as you said, they put it in a safety security box. They don't make copies and give the copies to the agent so the agent a, knows that they've been appointed an agent. B, could show up at the healthcare facility and prove to the healthcare providers that they are the agent. I think, in, in, going back to Charlie's points about the technicalities in different state laws, one thing that some states do, and this might be a 
a valuable thing that they do. This is North Dakota, for example, requires the agent to accept the appointment of agent. Right, oh, and so that just forces the discussion because the, it's it, it's bilateral, right? It's not I can just fill out and point you as the agent. You have to accept it, and I think that would that would force us to have the conversation. Well, what do you want me to do? Um, and, and I, I disagree yes. with you on that. Okay. Oh, well, now tell me why do you disagree? Be, because that usually gets signed uh, a year or two later when the person actually has to step in as agent. It's not a requirement of the validity of the document in the first place. So it doesn't mean that any discussion is taking place. Um, and if it were a requirement uh, of, of executing the document, then it would be yet another legal barrier we've created. So it, it's, the concept is great, but I don't think it works well in it's, practice. It's a good point. And, and, and it is, it's about, it's, we're always balancing, right, between we can put extra things to assure that the advance directive isn't forged, we can put extra things to make, sh to make sure that it's not valid until... A, a robust discussion has happened, but the more stuff we build, it, the harder it is to do. So we have to balance between the the, the legitimacy and the and the robustness of the advance directive versus the ease of completing it. Right. And it's not. And, and as Charlie suggested earlier, different states have struck that balance at different points. Right. That's interesting. Where can I ask um, just a simple question? So where should you put them? I mean, I've read stories where say hang it in a sleeve in your front hall. I mean, I know that, and they could be talking about post forms too. Mm -hmm. Um, should it be in the glove compartment? You're from Oregon, so Oregon has yes. a reg so, and West Virginia. Some states have robust registries, so electronic registries. But not of advanced directives of Polst and Molst. Many right? states have yes. both. Oh. Many states have both. Oh, interesting. Maryland okay. is working on that. Oh, all right. New York is not. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think I think your car is a is not a bad place at mm -hmm. all. And I have an elderly friend, and that's where she carries hers. Because she figures she's either going to be somewhere with the car or something bad is going to happen r r around the car. And, and everyone knows that, sh that Judy has it in the car. So, I mean, you know, that, that's not well, a bad, and it's not locked in the car. So, I mean, other yeah, people could get it. Box, so. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. know whether you're going to get to this, Janelle, but I have many folks that contact me in New York and say, I have no one to appoint. Yeah. Uh, you know, and... Some of them have outlived all of their family members, or some of them have alienated all of their friends. Um, and it's a real challenge. It and is so a real challenge. What, what, do you, what do we do with those people? Um, I, we go through, come on, you've lived in this apartment for how long? On the same floor? And you don't know your neighbors? Come on, let's talk about this. So you try and go through, if they don't have family, then do you have a friend? Do you have somebody? And you know, a living will is not my first choice, but it's better than nothing. So um, that and talk to your physician a lot about what your concerns and wishes are and what your hopes and fears are for your own end of life. Right. So and and I, I was going to say that, I mean, we know that where this works, um, and, and, you know, uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin is the, the example, that these are conversations that don't just occur once and yep. end up in a document that yep. sits wherever. This, this is a part of an ongoing dialogue. Yep. And if you had a way of capturing it in the electronic health record, and if people in a community could have access to the electronic health record, I could look at a patient who comes from another hospital and see, oh, there's a tab. And not only their advanced directive, but maybe their wishes, mm -hmm. their goals are clearly articulated. And when you start to do that systematically, that is when it really starts to work. It sure well, seems ask like- Ask yourself yeah. why, when you've completed a medical history form, and every time you go to a new specialist, yeah or a new doctor, you're filling out another one of these three-page medical histories, they've had allergies, blah, blah, blah. Why don't they ever ask you, yeah. who is your health care agent? Do you have a health care agent? Yeah, right. If you started hearing that from the time you started going to doctors on an annual basis That's or right. whenever, you would start, start maybe it would sink in, that I, I, I better talk to somebody <laughs> yeah. about being yeah. an agent. That's a good idea, Charlie. Right. What is it and who is it? Right. That makes sense. Um, Mary, and I did want to make sure to ask you you know, if your surrogate, surrogates may not honor your wishes, tell us about your mom's experience with a health system not honoring an advanced directive. So, so my mother is now 91, and she has been adamant for many years that she doesn't want life support, and maybe because my dad had a long illness. So she, and her most form is pinned to her refrigerator. I see it every Saturday when we grocery shop together. She even wears something tagged to her bra because I said, that's where the paramedics are going to go. So she has, she's thought about it. So three years ago, she broke her hip. 
And it wasn't an accident. It was all very calm. And they, her, she lives in a retirement community. And they called me and they said, we're sending her to the ER. And I said, OK. And I met her there. And we spent much of the night. And she was cognitively intact the entire while, not heavily pain medicated, so able to express her wishes. The next morning, I come to the hospital after both of us got a little sleep, and I realize she doesn't have a DNR bracelet on in the hospital, which is what many hospitals do. Because So if I'm a nurse, and I'm going down a hallway, and I don't know the patient, and, and an alarm goes off, and they start to look like they're going into cardiac arrest, I look for a bracelet. If there isn't one, I start CPR. Okay. So my mom doesn't have the bracelet on. And I say to her, where's your bracelet? She says, I don't know. So I mean, it's been a long night. So I go out to her nurse, and I say, where is my mother's DNR bracelet? And she says, your mother is a full code. And I said, not on this planet. She is not. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? Oh, no, she's a full code. I said, well, that can't be. I said, and where? full code for people who don't It know. means you would do everything to resuscitate her. So I said, why don't we, where are the papers that came with her from her retirement community. So we go over to the paper chart, and she opens the tab. And there on the top is my mother's most form that says, do not resuscitate. Maybe she can't read? <laughs> well, maybe. They, you know, there, there are so many questions. Yeah. They, they, didn't, they didn't see the form. They didn't ask my mother. Or if they did, they didn't ask in a way that she, because she could clearly have advocated, advocated for herself. So I mean. If some, she wasn't in danger of going into cardiac arrest, but had she, I would have come to the hospital, stood with the form and my intubated mother, and said, you know, what are we going to do about this? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's, that's scary with you. And, and I knew yeah. to ask, right. beca because I'm the most informed surrogate decision maker <laughs> you've ever met. But yeah. if I had been just the daughter, I wouldn't have known. Right. That's that's a the, the good news. I mean, just from yeah. I, and I know the law isn't the only answer, but <laughs> but increasingly, <laughs> just over the past year or, or eighteen months, there were a number of you know successful uh, lawsuits when clinicians have not honored yes. a MOLST or POLST or an advanced directive. In the past, for years and years, the courts were not receptive to these arguments because if you're resuscitated, it's hard to show that your life is is a harm. And, and, and therefore, these cases weren't successful, and therefore, people didn't bring them anymore because it, it seemed futile. But now the courts are receptive, and the plaintiff's attorneys are willing to bring these cases. So we're seeing more and more of them. And these I think these are the so-called unlawful life cases, right? Yeah, wrongful resuscitation. Wrongful resuscitation. I mean, it's, she, she, it's a battery, yes. right? Yeah. She right. didn't want you're, you're giving somebody treatment that they did not right. want. And and can we talk a little bit about that? About um, having treatment that they did not want, because this will transition into our next topic. But how, how having treatment that you don't want, uh, what's the, the legal precedent or the legal argument um, to defend against that or to, to say that, um, you know, that you shouldn't have treatment that you don't want? What's the legal argument for it? Um, the bat I'm thinking of the batter you know, battery. If you, right. If you, it, I mean, battery is normally, it's a very simple cause of action, um, which is simply, it, it's an unwanted touching. Right. So if they if they did chest compressions, you're you're just touching somebody and they didn't want you to touch them. It's, it's a really simple cause of action. Yeah. Um, the other, you know, there's no no complicated elements and things to prove. Um, that's that's it's your right. Right. You have a right. You have a right to, to not to be. It's touched. a negative liberty yes. right to keep people. If, if you don't want to be touched. In, in, in life, well, and we the, do on the street than, is, we yeah. do do more than touching you. Right. I mean, it is you break a, your ribs. It is, mm -hmm. it is a very aggressive thing yeah. to, to re try to resuscitate somebody with CPR. So I mean, th this is, you know, it is battery. I mean, you cause harm. And I mean, I've had people who went through that who, who have gone, been resuscitated who said, never do that to me again. Mm -hmm. Now, I've had other people say, you know what? I changed my mind. That worked out. Mm -hmm. So. <clears throat> and, and that cause of action is, is usually tied to uh, negligence for not having informed consent. I mean, there, I mean in, in situations that aren't real emergencies uh, or, or very foreseeable. Um, and there's at least one, uh, in a case where pain wasn't managed, there's at least one California case yeah. where, where uh, uh, an elder abuse statute was used uh, yeah. because of the infliction of pain caused by the lack of adequate palliative care. Hmm. Interesting. So if we see more of these suits, then maybe <coughs> it'll become more common um, to know that you need to follow yeah. the directives. I, th I think 
you said something about changing your mind, right? Oh, yes. Well, I, that's another I tell you, that is not to be ignored because um, so long as you have that person in the bed able to talk to you, <clears throat> able to actually communicate a choice that they're making, it doesn't matter how long they have said, I, by God, I am never going to have it. I'm going to refuse. And then there they are looking at the consequences of I don't want any of that stuff. And they have every right to say, you know what, I, I, yeah. maybe this is OK. And, and, and it gets overlooked in, at times in ways because I've got this document here. Right. And I say, wait a second, you have a person in the bed who's telling you something different. And I think that that is the practical yep. complication of all of this. People do change their mind. Things that were totally unacceptable become maybe not so unacceptable. Right. I, I never forget, I had a patient who had COPD, some bad lungs. And she had been intubated a few times. We had always been able to get her off the vent. We knew there was going to come a day when we And she always said, I'm not going to want a trach. So there came that day where she was in the ICU. And she said, I'm going to go for the trach. And she lived for several months in our long-term care facility during which she was able to see her children and her grandchildren and be part of life. And who was any of us to say that that wasn't a good quality of life? She changed her mind. And people do. So that's the other problem with the documents, is that they, they kind of give you a general idea, but then real life kind of happens. Yep. And the, your latest authentic expression of wishes, right? Yep. And that's when you're in the bed and you're like, no, no. When I'm standing over yeah. you with the intubation tube, <laughs> oh, and you're like, right. OK. okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. If, you're, if you're putting your wishes to writing, this mm -hmm. is one big caution, is when you're upright and healthy, thinking, oh, I could live yes, that that's way. That's right, that's right. Just stay away from that, you know, yeah. as much as you can. Yeah. Uh, inform your agent what your values are, or what's important to you in life, what your priorities are. But don't try to make specific health care yeah. decisions years down the road because you you're like, likely to change. You mean, like, don't say, I don't want to be intubated? That's right. Right. Because you know what? Maybe it's just a bee sting that you're allergic to a bee. And if you're not intubated, you'll be dead in three minutes. If you are intubated, you can breathe. They'll give you some adrenaline. They take the tube out, and you're fine. What people are imagining is they're going to be connected to that tube forever. Right. So in fact, you really have to explore, well, what do you mean by that? I don't want Tell to be, me more I don't want about to be that. for longer. Yeah, you know, exactly. do it if, I, if it's exactly. going to be more than But don't so assume many that you know what right. this person thinks, wishes, fears, or hopes for. You got to ask. There, there right. are trade-offs every step of the yeah. way, and they change. So how you're going to bargain among, in your own head what those yeah. trade-offs are is going to change. Uh, I, I like to use an aphorism that I stole from a colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Tom Fanukin at Johns Hopkins, yeah. who used to, he says this is an old Spanish aphorism. It goes, the bull looks different from inside the ring. <laughs> and, and that's really what it's like when you get yeah. closer to yeah. these decisions. Things start yeah. to look different. Start to look different, which is an excellent segue to talking about um, what have been some of the most difficult stories that we have run recently and difficult issues. Um, the issue of voluntary stopping of, of uh, eating and drinking and stopping oral assisted feeding in patients with dementia. Um, Judy, I'd like you just to give us a sense of, of how often this comes up and why you're becoming increasingly concerned about it. Which? The, about, about. Be said? Be said. Or the, yeah. the dementia and, and stopping eating and drinking. Um, the dementia. Let's talk about that. Let, well, first we should say VSED is when you have capacity yeah. and can decide to stop eating and drinking. Um, it's, um, you know, an option for uh, people with terminal illness that a small but growing group of people has opted for, um, usually resulting in death through dehydration within a couple weeks. Yes. And so that's one question, <clears throat> use, opting for that. But opting for it when you have dementia. And, and the reason it's come up is a couple of high profile cases. Uh, there is a case in Oregon involving um, both cases, and a case in Canada where people who said that they had expressed their wishes of not wanting um, assisted feeding, but artificial nutrition and hydration years earlier, um, were, the nursing homes where they were insisted on spoon feeding them, hand feeding them, and their family said it was against their wishes in both cases. So. so in New York State, um, where we have some of the worst health care law, I'd say, across the country, um, one of the stipulations in the health care proxy law is that the agent must know the wishes of 
the patient with regards to artificial nutrition and hydration. So everybody knows about that. And they check that off. My agent knows I would never want, I don't have to write it down, they just know what my wishes are, and they think they're done, right? Um, increasingly, I'm hearing from a new group of patients that I never heard from before. And I've been doing this work for, as I say, as, as Jonelle said, 15, 20 years now. Um, patients are calling me because they have gotten a new diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And inevitably, they have some personal horrific memories of seeing someone die by inches and badly uh, from this disease. And they're terrified of the final stages of this disease. And there are seven. And by the time you get to the seventh stage, you can't speak. You don't recognize anyone. You're immobile in bed. And you are incontinent. Um, and, and most people think, particularly if they've seen someone they love die this way, that it's a horror. So they want to know what they can do. What can they do? So after a lot of counseling and talking to family and all the rest of it and their physicians, we, I say to them, you have two choices. While you retain decision-making capacity, you could stop eating and drinking. But let me tell you, that's a real challenge. When you don't have an underlying disease, that's really hard. Uh, but you, legally, <coughs> legally, you can do that. <laughs> uh, so long as you're decisionally capable, nobody's coercing you. And I say you must have access to palliative oversight, medical oversight. And you have to have support, caregiving, and family or social. Many people like that idea. But actually making that happen is really a challenge. And so far, I haven't seen anybody take that step. The next option is a very, very, very comprehensive living will that, that is in addition to a healthcare proxy. So you have an agent who's very familiar with what's been written in this living will saying that when I get to a particular stage of dementia, five, six, four, who knows, and you describe what that is. You describe what you could no longer do that's terribly important to you that you'd be able to do. You've lost decision-making capacity. You can no longer physically feed yourself. And what you say is, I don't want to be hand-fed. I don't want to have assisted feeding by anyone because nobody thinks about that, right? They think about they're done. They fit, they've said, I don't want artificial nutrition and hydration. But what they forget about is somebody will feed them until they don't know what to do with the glop in their mouth, which is the very final stage of the terminal stage of, of dementia. The other thing that I suggest that they also stipulate in this advanced directive is that even if a spoon is brought to the corner of their mouth, and their mouth pops open like a little baby bird's because it's a reflex, they haven't changed their mind. They still don't want to be fed even though they may appear to be cooperating in eating, they haven't decided. And they don't actually have a mind to change at this point. So this is what I suggest. And it's a several page document. It's similar to, but more, <coughs> I'd say, more advanced than the Washington State mm -hmm. recent and document. And Washington State, um, Washington, End of Life Washington, recently published a new set of instructions um, exactly for this. But, but as Judy says, um, not, n not, not as, as detailed, right? No. Do you, and do you, Thad, do you agree, too, that it's not as detailed as, it, as they could have been? Or I know you pushed them to make them more detailed. That's right. I think, yeah. I mean, you referenced the two cases, the Oregon case yeah. and the Vancouver case. And, and one of the key reasons the courts refused to um, enforce the documents that the patients had completed in those cases. And both patients completed the advanced directive specifically for the purposes that Judy's talking about. Right. They thought, I don't want to live in late stages of dementia. Um, but they were inadequately clear and specific as to what it is that they, that that's what they were talking about. Um, and therefore, since we have these two lessons, which are geographically right near the state of Washington, I said, you have to be overwhelmingly clear and specific. Um, in the way that Judy said, and I, and I think, if, 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 and I told them this, but they had other considerations to balance. Right. Um, so I think that's right. I think even, I would even go a step farther. I would say you might even consider 
making a video yeah. on yes. top of it. I was just going to ask you that. When yeah. either the exactly. family exactly. or even the clinicians see the patient yeah. in her own uh, right. voice right. And, uh, uh, and speaking and saying, this is what I really want and I understand what I'm asking for, it helps people think, oh, I guess she really did mean it, right? And I would also say, Thad, that's very helpful for the patient who will not remember having completed this document, which is a horror in and of itself, right? Who's, who's, who's doing this to me? Yeah. Right. And we don't have any tests of any of this yet. Not yet. Um, and so I have to ask you guys about the great Idaho question that we talked about this summer. Um, Charlie put together a, a chart of all of the um, statutes in various states that mention oral assisted feeding. And um, by his calculations, it looked like Idaho might have been the only state where it could have been permissible. D do I have that right? And I know you guys disagree a little bit about that. So. It does on its face, although if you read the whole statute, the statute itself is somewhat contradictory. The very, the very next uh, provision in the statute that's, that says um, you can withhold nourishment if, if, if it's in your uh, advanced directive says that um, the providers still have an obligation to provide all comfort care. So, you know, many providers just see this as comfort care and they're not going to pay attention to what you said anyway. Um, and then they have um, uh, the, the living will part of, the, of their act uh, applies uh, only when you are terminally ill or in a persistent vegetative state. Yeah. So it might not work yeah. for yeah. somebody in the, yeah. in the situation that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, they don't seem to have the same restriction on the agent's authority, but this is one of the kind of things you have to scratch your head about in the statute as well. Does the, does the terminal condition thing apply to the agent or is that different? So, so yes, on its face, it would seem to be uh, different than the other states but it's a jumble of different messages that is going to probably scare most, most providers into yeah. saying no. Right. And that's the other thing is that a provider and a facility could just not honor it at all. Well, and I have to yeah. tell you, I mean, as somebody who, um, who works with, with nursing staff and nursing assistants, that is very difficult for them. I, I mean, the Terry Schiavo case was really interesting. We were had and and in a bizarre way helpful because at least for that point in time, I had patients who came in and said, "I don't want that," or yeah. "I would be okay with that." So yeah. for a while, it was a handy thing we yeah. could all refer to. Yeah. But I remember that the staff that I worked with, some of them had a hard time with the thought that we're not going to feed someone, yeah. you know? Yeah. And there's the whole, the family yeah. already has a hard time. So it, it, this is, again, we try to be very rational about things that are not yeah. rational. These are deep-seated cultural yep. issues. And even yep. when the family and the patient agree, I'm telling you it's hard for the nursing staff sometimes. You have to, to have a lot of upstream buy-in, upstream buy-in from not just the patient and the family, but the physician, the family attorney, yeah. You have to shop yeah. around for a long-term care facility. That will be okay. Um, but there's something that uh, Paul Menzel pointed out to me, that many nursing home facilities say, oh, we can't do this because we are obliged to feed everyone because, after all, otherwise it would be elder abuse and we have to. In fact, there's an exception, right, in the, in the Medicare provision for... Well, Directed? The CMS people told me that's not true. Really? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you their email. Oh my gosh. Yeah, they, I believe Paul Menzel. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so it is, it is. I mean, that's this is why, right? Even if Idaho were, and it's not even as clear as we'd like. Yeah. Even if it were, right? So if Idaho over here, on the other end of the spectrum, you might say you have a state like Wisconsin, which yeah. specifically says agents do not have the authority to authorize VSET on behalf of a patient. Is that right? And a lot of states are in the middle, right? And so Minnesota, just as an example. An agent can make any health care decision on behalf of yeah. the patient. And then health care is defined super broadly. That would include oral nutrition and hydration. Very good. But then you still have the problem. You have, elder, you have, you yeah. have Medicare yeah. regulations. Yeah. You have state law yeah. on elder abuse, elder neglect. You have, is, does it constitute assisted suicide? People are concerned about that. Yeah. So you have completely separate statutory schemes. And it's not clear how, as Charlie suggested, how they intermingle. Yeah. So there's a, there's a yeah. significant amount of uncertainty. And we know that healthcare clinicians are very, very, very risk averse, and therefore yeah. they're generally going to decline well, to comply. Well, when in doubt, we save people because it's yeah. just, it just—it just right. seems like the better way to go. Right. Yeah. Right. Not only are physicians risk adverse, hospital counsel is doubly <laughs> risk adverse. Oh my God! You don't want to. Oh yes. Oh yes. Yep. All right. Well. 
Um, I, I think we've had about an hour of discussion ourselves, and so I'm going to turn this over to the audience for questions, and also questions from our Facebook Live audience. So we have microphones um, in the audience, and uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand, and our panelists will answer. Hi, um, I'm Rachel Maisler with the LEAD Coalition, and leaders engaged on Alzheimer's disease, and this is more of a comment two-prong comment than a question. Um, first of all, as somebody who has been the loved one of somebody with an advanced directive and somebody without an advanced directive, both at very different stages in their lives, um, an advanced directive is the best gift you can give to anybody because you know you made the right decisions if they had an advanced directive and you don't doubt yourself and it's easier to grieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to bring up is there's the Palliative Care and Hospice Education Act, which is currently with the House Energy and Workforce um, Subcommittee on Health, that's worth probably reaching out to your members and asking to co-sponsor, because that does focus on hospice and palliative care training, but also includes a provision to launch a national campaign to educate the public about these services, which should include advanced directives. So thank you. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, thank you. So I know we talked a little bit about, you know, patients changing their mind, but in the case where a patient actually isn't awake, but there may have been some sort of life change that occurred or lifestyle change that occurred after the advanced directive was written, and it may be, it could be reasonably argued that because of that lifestyle change, something in the directive can, is like negated or altered in some way. What kind, How of, is that what kind of change are you thinking of, just so um, people know? The easiest example I could think of is, you know, somebody converts to a certain religion that maybe has, you know, some bans on certain types of, you know, interventional medicine, or maybe because of that they would want life-saving, you know, measures so to be taken. they have an agent, or have they just written this down? They do have the agent, or it's written down, or, you know, somebody, whoever is acting as their agent, who knows them at a very personal level and knows about this lifestyle change mm -hmm. is arguing against what's written in, in the advanced directive. Oh. I'm not sh just how would that be handled overall and has that ever, you know, I'm sure it's come up before. There, so there have been a number of cases, uh, some from New York, I think it was, um, they switched, I don't remember if they used to be Orthodox Ju Judaism and then they switched to or from, but, but these sorts of cases have come up and so there may be other family members um, who are gonna challenge the advanced directive. And so all these things do go to court. And so advanced directives, if you can prove that, that the, it's presumed, it's to be clear and convincing evidence of what the patient's, patient's preferences are, but that is rebuttable, right? And so if, if somebody can say, no, when she wrote that, she was still Catholic, now she's Jewish, and therefore we shouldn't honor the old preferences because they don't reflect what she would have wanted. And if you can, it's a high burden, but sometimes people have been able to reach it. And I have to say, I mean, as a clinician, and, and I've practiced in a number of hospitals, you know, we're going to listen to something like that. We're not going to just say, sorry, there's a piece of paper. Because again, <laughs> if we're going to make a mistake, we're going to make a mistake in favor of, we're going to keep this person going for at least a while longer until yeah. we can sort yeah. this all out. Yeah, exactly. Because we want to do the right thing, and we want to do the right thing for the, for the people who are going to be left. We are very conscious of the fact that this is going to be already a big loss for that family, and we don't want to make it worse by arguing about technical things that, you know, really are. You might have an advanced directive from 20 years ago before you even knew you had heart failure. You, I, that's a very convincing case to me as a clinician for why I shouldn't necessarily think that that document is up to date. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys, for the legal thing, but... No, you're right. <laughs> And I would also say from my experience with New York physicians, if it doesn't matter if you've got a healthcare agent who is authorized to be the decision maker and there's conflict amongst all of the siblings who are there at the bedside, that physician is gonna go, you guys work this out. And when you come to some consensus, you let us know. Meanwhile, and then we're gonna, gonna call me. Yeah, but meanwhile, <laughs> we're gonna keep this person perking no, along. Absolutely. So that's the, that's the default in the face of conflict. So that's Pretty worth so. keeping in mind as well. Hi, Barbara Gay from Leading Age. Um, it, you've, you've basically addressed one of the things I was gonna raise. Um, I had a personal experience with this last year with my dad, 
And um, he and his significant other both had posts posted on the refrigerator. But when push came to shove, his significant other was not on board with the decision that my brother, who was the agent, was making. So and we, it, what, it didn't even involve things like surgery or intubation. It was more, you know, should we give antibiotics for urinary tract infections and so on. So these are very tough decisions. And it's, it's one thing to have the concept that, yes, dad doesn't want to be kept going forever. And it's another thing to make these very specific, you know, non-heroic measure type decisions. Which is where palliative care can often be very helpful, right? right? The goal here in the filter through all of those decisions should be comfort. And if you're looking at what's going to make dad more comfortable, it can be an easier decision. Right. And, you know, again, so you name somebody as your health care agent. But that doesn't mean that the rest of the family don't have some yeah. input. I, I can tell you, we have family meetings in the hospital. Yeah. We don't have surrogate agent meetings. We, we try to get everybody into a room, and then social workers involved in chaplaincy. And we really try to help facilitate a consensus decision. Because you know these people are going to have to live with each other for the rest of their lives. And the fact that one person had the authority, and there were six other siblings, and they were just overruled, that just doesn't seem to be the right way to make any kind of important life decision, right? So I mean, we, we try to help the other siblings but you hope that you don't get into really, you know, a mess because that that's just it makes a difficult decision even harder. Right. Yeah, the, the the legalistic model of of advanced directives um, sometimes leads people to think, okay, I've named an agent, I've had a conversation with my agent, and that's it. It's it's not uh, a duo. It's a family. It's whoever is, is makes up that constellation. Is in my experience is the same. Is that the hospital wants everybody to be on board? They're not going to. They're not going to uh, abide by somebody uh, who might sue them because yeah. they disagree later yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, and, they, and, they, and their natural inclination is anyway is to have consensus decisions right. to the extent possible. And if you don't name someone, there are state surrogacy laws. So you know, we go to your spouse, we go to your adult children. We, and I remember I had a guy who had five adult children. Well, he didn't name one of them. So I had to get five people to agree. Because none of them had, you know, supremacy in that regard. So that's where you really have to get into the facilitation. Wow. Um, what do our Facebook Live people want to know? We have a question from Brooke. Has the current opioid crisis affected the ability to provide palliative care? Is there something we can do in tackling this problem? It's not really an advanced directives question, but... Um, I have to say that I've practiced palliative care long enough to have seen this pendulum swing in one direction from we're not giving anyone pain medication, we're not giving people opioids to, we're probably giving too many people opioids to now it's swinging back the other way. I had a case recently of a woman who had terrible metastatic cancer and her oncologist, she was an active, uh, had an active substance abuse problem and her oncologist said he, he wouldn't give her opioids because she was an addict. So what is she going to do? She's out in the streets of Baltimore buying heroin. Sure she is. Because yeah. I would do the yeah. same. Yeah. So I mean, I think it's, it's getting in the way of pain management and giving these medications to the people who, for whom these medications were intended. And we are, we are working as a field to try to help with guidelines. We certainly don't want to hand opioids out to people who don't need them. But you can make a case that people certainly with end stage cancer and certain other illnesses that is what these drugs are for, and we have to find a way to still be able to give them in whatever doses are appropriate. I'm That's nervous right. some states are talking about limiting doses. I've, I've lectured in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan where they, you can't give more than a certain amount of morphine yeah. to somebody yeah. per day. Yeah. Well, that's crazy because, yeah. you know, you might need more, and then what are you going to do? I think a part of that problem, though, is I don't think until recently anybody was really looking at what happens with those leftover opiates in the, in the house that hospice is bringing in by the truckload because it's, you know, liquid morphine is dirt cheap, so we'll just bring you lots of it and anything else that you need. And I, I think that there wasn't a sort of a, a routinized responsibility for whose job is it to go in and collect that stuff. 
But it's no one's job. Exactly. You can't collect it. Exactly. I had a hospice colleague told me that a daughter of one of her uh, deceased patients said to her, I'm not giving this back. This is my inheritance. Yeah, yeah. But Scary. That's, that's awful. It is, but yeah. I mean, this yeah. is... We had wrote a whole story about hospice drug diversion. Yeah. Yeah. Dreadful. Yes. Is there a microphone? No. Okay. <laughs> right now who's being spoon-fed. Mm -hmm. Being spoon-fed, you say? Spoon-fed. Yeah. It's my stepmother, so uh -huh. it's not my mother, mm -hmm. but she's the wife of my 94-year-old father. Wow. Who was a lawyer and still going to his law practice every day, so he's 150% wow. cognitive, you yes. know, the mm -hmm. crossword puzzle in 20 minutes kind yeah. of guy. Yeah. He loves the fact that she's being spoon-fed. Sure. He thinks she takes pleasure in it. Yeah. When the other members of the family see, we see her eyes are closed, and I was fascinated by what you said and what I read about the reflex thing. Mm -hmm. In my belief, and I'm a lawyer too, so I have no clue, it looks like she's opening her mouth because she's sleeping when she's being fed yeah. mm -hmm. out of reflex. Yeah. Yeah, and I wince. Yeah. And then he says, if we're at dinner, keep feeding her. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really, um, it's very difficult, but is there really an objective test as to when it's a reflex or not. One of the articles said it's like tapping on your knee and you can tell. This is a fairly new field of, of yeah. directive. Um, I know I've stood at the bedside of somebody who's had Alzheimer's disease for 15 years and has been hand fed lovingly by her paid for AIDS uh, for seven years. Um, and it takes an hour and a half of very diligent, endearing talk in addition to the spoon being brought to the corner of her mouth, and her eyes are also closed. Um, the problem is that your stepmother probably didn't say what she would want. And so long as someone, without stipulating ahead of time, that I do not specifically want to be hand fed, the obligation is to continue to attempt to feed somebody who you're not having to hold their nose, they're opening their mouth, because that's what we do. That's how we care for our elderly people. Um, and it's, I think this is going to be the next tsunami, frankly. This is going to be the next tsunami. It's even, and this is the, your point, it's a good point. You, you can get an extra cookie afterwards. So um, <laughs> the, 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 um, even if you did the, the, the Judy's very careful advanced directive, even if she had done that and she had articulated her preferences very carefully, you still have the question, is it a reflex or is it a decision? So in the Margot Bentley case, which was litigated in Vancouver, the, the issue was whether or not she had an advantage, the, the, the advanced directive was valid and whether she could refuse. Okay, the court ultimately said none of that matters. I mean, he went ahead and decided it, but none of that matters because today, when the spoon is put in her mouth, she swallows. And she swallows for applesauce, but not for mashed potatoes. So she is Deciding. making a decision. She has the capacity, stage seven Alzheimer's, she has the decision-making capacity to make that decision. So whatever she wrote in the advanced directive, the c current decision today constitutes a revocation of the prior instructions. And if that's true. Nurse. This was a nurse. Margaret Van she, she was a nurse. She was a dementia nurse. Yes. Right, yeah. but the expert witnesses under oh oath, God. Alzheimer specialists, that's what they testify to. So that question is whether, is it reflex or yeah. it, is it capacitated? Choice. We need, we yeah. need some medical uh, but, investigation but of that question. Say, I, I think this issue is going to resolve itself because at a certain point, most dementia patients lack the ability to swallow. They, they, they <clears> stop. <throat> they don't know so, what to so do with you, it. So you, you can put things in her mouth and she won't be able to swallow it appropriately. She'll, it'll seven go... years, my patient. Seven years. Well, so. Yeah. You know, there are a handful of states, a small handful, that uh, any objection to a health care decision that your agent makes uh, you have the uh, must be respected and override your, your agent. And a few states, Texas is one of them, says even if you lack capacity. Now, wait, the agent can what? 
the, the, the patient can override the agent's decision. Even if they lack capacity? Even if they lack capacity. So right. it's an oxymoron legally, but Texas there, there are three, three or four states <laughs> that have that kind of language, which makes us shake our heads. Yes, right. yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. What, here and then here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Mike Knopp, and I'm with the Pulmonary Hypertension Association. So most of my constituents aren't uh, elderly adults, but they're living with a rare, chronic, and currently incurable disease. And one of our roles as a patient association is to provide the best information we can. And one of the things, one of the conversations we try to have with folks is around advanced care planning, which, as you can imagine, is, is difficult for us. So one of the barriers we face in having that conversation, one of the barriers our, the families of our, our folks face and the patients face is whether or not to commit to this kind of decision making. There's a fear there that signing a paper and you know going down the road, even of palliative care, is giving up. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if the panel could talk about that barrier, the, the psychological barrier with a patient or a family around whether this means giving up or not. Well, I, I think this is the challenge that we have with hospice. So the evidence is pretty clear that uh, people who get hospice don't live any less long. They actually might live longer, and they have a higher quality of life, even though they have less medical care. But the perception, it, because we do a great job of, of providing support and addressing a lot of issues and helping them to be physically comfortable and emotionally and spiritually comfortable, I, I, I don't, this, this is so challenging when people say it's giving up. So these are the, the families and the cancer patients who are really getting counterproductive treatment. And I see them in the ICU all the time. I would just say, though, the, the other side of that hospice discussion enrollment is you have to agree to stop life Which is a big problem. Treatment. If right. it were palliative care that could be provided in the home with all of the team effect that palliative care is in the clinic, it would be fabulous because you can continue to get life prolonging interventions and symptom right. management. And we know from the data that patients do live longer and that they do live better when they have palliative care. So that, I suspect, is at the heart of your, your patient population and their family's fear is if I sign anything here, it's going to say that I want to stop a certain kind of treatment and I'm going to be allowed to die. So the challenge for you is to educate those families and their potential health care agents, because the job of the agent is not to decide what they would want or what they want for their loved one, but it's what their loved one wants for themselves. There is a CMS uh, demonstration program, right, right. that has gotten right. off the ground that, uh, that uh, in a certain number of sites that allows hospice-type services concurrent with curative yeah. services yeah. and doesn't have that restriction. But I don't think it's going to be another... It's, it's two or three or four it, years it, it, before we least, hear results of least, that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I refer to that hospice in Baltimore every chance I get yeah. because that is, you know, not having to give something up and yeah. I get hospice. Yeah. yeah. I, tell me more. Of yeah. course. That's and there's one hospice in New York City that also provides home palliative care. Right. Thank God. Right. right. And we're working on a payment structure. Yeah. 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 So um, let's take one more question from the audience and then a Facebook Live. Hi, I'm Jack Schwartz from University of Maryland Law School. Um, I have a feeling that if we looked at a video of a comparably expert panel on ad advanced care planning and advanced directives from 20 or 25 years ago, the themes would have been remarkably the same, and some of the language that you used would have been the same. Um, do you think that, uh, so your panel is in a way a triumph of hope over experience, um, <laughs> like second marriages. Are, um, <laughs> Do you think that there have been sufficient changes in law, in s clinical systems approaches, in reimbursement streams, so that things really will be different? Or 20 years from now, when your successor panel is sitting up there, will they be saying the same thing? Good question. That's for uh, you, Thad, <laughs> and, and Charlie. On the, on the legal side, I think there has been a real shift, and 20 years ago, the, the legalistic model of advanced planning was, was really the model, uh, although clinicians knew a little bit better than that. But still, in the, in the general discussion, uh, we, we th thought of the form. It had all the requirements, the legal requirements. 
we've really moved away from that uh, in baby steps. But we've moved uh, uh, noticeably away from that towards a communication model of care. I mean, I, I tell people that there's really only three questions you've got to answer. Who do you want to be, speak for you? Uh, what guidance do you want to give them? And uh, how are you going to communicate all this? And those sound like three simple questions, but each one of them is very complicated. But moving towards that communication model and notions of a person and family-centered care, um, the, at least the, the language is certainly changing. Uh, and uh, uh, being able to provide uh, counseling under, under Medicare is, is, is there, but, um, you know, and, and there's, some, there's some early signs that it's actually being used. The billing codes. Yeah, right. uh, the billing codes. For physicians, yeah. Um, so, so I do think there, we're, we're seeing change. It's not, not far enough along. There's, it's really, you know, why can't, you, uh, why can't there be many kinds of advanced directives out there, if we're I'm talking about the forms now, that appeal to different audiences, whether it be a religious audience or people who want to do one uh, focused on dementia uh, or VSED. And um, why, why can't you g get these kinds of forms and be, be confident that they're good in every state? Mm -hmm. Well, you can't right now. Uh, because of all this balkanization of, of the law. And uh, that part of it, we've only seen very small changes towards simplification, and, uh, but not enough. We, we, did a, uh, we tried to do a bare bones power of attorney for health care. Uh, this goes back three, four or five years ago, and it's still on, free on our website. It's called the multi-state health care power of attorney. We tried to see if we could do it so that it met the technical requirements every state. Mm -hmm. And we got it to the point where we think it's pretty good in all but five states. And because those barriers were just totally insurmountable. And that's kind of a sad state of the law that, you know, we, we have to make people run the gamut of 50 state laws. Yeah. But I, I, I am hopeful for a number of reasons. We, we have a growing <coughs> evidence base, oh, excuse me, <coughs> a growing evidence base that says palliative care and hospice is effective. We have models now that we're delivering it not just in the hospital but in the community. We're training other people to do it. We have electronic health records where we now might have a way of sharing you know, advanced directives across institutions and facilities. We're working on payment structures. So I'm a policy person here in Washington. Why am I doing that and not take care in, taking care of patients? Because we have to fix some of these things with policy. We're working on you know, payment models for community-based palliative care. We're working on legislation that's going to try to make advanced care planning easier. So do demonstration models, I mean, I'm a palliative care person. I'm, a, I'm inherently optimistic. But I think, I think that, you know, look, with the aging of the population, these are, these are going to become just more and more difficult. We do not have enough ICU beds. We certainly don't have enough ICU nurses for all 72 million baby boomers to spend the last six weeks of our lives in the ICU. That but is who just wants to. Well, even if we did want to, we couldn't do that. Yeah. So I think we have we we have about 15 years to kind of get this all squared away because they're going to be you know a huge part of the population is going to be very old and we're all going to have chronic illness. Half of us are going to need long-term care. Another thing we haven't prepared for. That's exactly. a whole other conversation right. we could have. So I, I think we have to solve some of these things. Part of the work that I do working with patients is um, in educating them about how to talk to their doctors, how to ask the questions that if they don't ask, they're not going to get enough information to make an informed choice about the various options that might be available to them and the consequences of those particular options. So in, in helping patients learn better styles of communication, we are indirectly educating physicians who need to know that these are issues that are not going to be ignored anymore, I think, by a growing number, proportion, of, of informed citizens, so that I would hope that 10 or 20 years from now, there are going to be private citizens up here talking about their experiences and their recommendations and what they think should be done to, to work on what's, what's progressed. But maybe I'm being terribly optimistic yeah. too. I think, I think you're right. Nothing's changed in the last 20 years. I am, like everybody else, optimistic. For the next, we'll, we'll see, <laughs> you can check on me. I think the two big things are these, 20 years. A, I do think the Medicare, so far the, the payment codes have 
produced hundreds of thousands of more advanced directives. And I think it's going to get better than that. I think some systems are going to adopt this as an entire service line, right? Cardiology, oncology, advanced care planning. The, the number, it's, it's financially viable to be an entire separate professionalized service line in, in healthcare hospital systems. And then the second thing is, everything we're talking about, about this end of life stuff, it's just the tip of an iceberg, right? Below the end of the advanced care planning stuff is a is an gigantic below the water avalanche of, of unwanted medical treatment. So the people with decision-making capacity are getting tons of unwanted medical treatment because as Judy was saying, their clinicians are not giving them complete and clear risks, benefits, and alternatives. Um, and so people are getting way more treatment that if they really understood what the low benefits were and the high risks were, they never would have accepted that treatment. And so what we're moving toward, and this is happening in the state of Washington, is using decision aids. Shrinking the role of the physician, basically. Um, and, and so the patient will get a certified decision aid, um, which will give them balanced and complete and accurate information in a way that's understandable for them. So the state of Washington is now accepting uh, proposals for certification for decision aids. They've already certified ones in obstetrics and joint and spine. Now they're doing end of life in cardiac. CMS is supposed to be doing that at the national level they, for seven and a half years. They haven't moved on that, but recently the NQF down the street here has come out with some white papers trying to push CMS to do what it was supposed to do in the Affordable Care Act. I think in 20 years, it's, so it's been going slow, but I think in 20 years we'll get to the point where we're going to be using certified patient decision aids and we'll all be making better health care decisions because of it. So okay. like advocates? No, 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 I, mean, no. I mean like I'm Tools. talking about videos. Oh, oh, oh like uh, we're back. Interactive. 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 Are you talking about people sometimes or they're, Sometimes they're coaches. Oh, so I sometimes see. it's okay, a person. Sometimes it's just a decision grid. I Laying see. off gotcha. like lumpectomy, gotcha. mastectomy, side by side, risks, okay, benefits. Right. Okay. Um, the idea is that you're getting visual, highly graphic in, information in, and not just multi-polysyllabic discourse right, with and your grade physician. Five reading. <laughs> or grade yes, four and, and, and a little right. reading. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. I just want to add, though, that I mean, w once you go into the ED, the odds are you're going to get over treatment. But there's, short of that, there's large swaths of the population that are getting undertreated, and uh, that's, oh, that's true. the well, other side of the coin. Yeah. Uh, we're almost out of time. Is there one more question from Facebook Live? What's interesting, that is that a number of our Facebook Live um, viewers asked about the role of technology, and you kind of touched on it um, in your last comments, and I'm wondering whether each of you has any th thoughts about what role technology will play in helping individuals create and um, share their directives, and is there a role for technology? There are health systems right now uh, in which on the screen, there is always a tab for advanced care plans that you can get to in one tab. Not enough systems. I don't work in a place like Oregon. that. Again. But there are a few. <laughs> Oregon's one. La Crosse, Wisconsin's one. Mm -hmm. And, and in, under that tab, it can be uh, your advanced directive. It can be a pulse form. Or, or it can be uh, clinical notes of a conversation. That's just as much an advanced directive, in my opinion, as anything else. Uh, but until uh, every, every health care provider uh, has that routinized as, as a one-click uh, 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 step to get to your advanced care plans. In the medical uh, record. In, in the medical yeah, record. In, Got in it. the electronic yep. record. Yep. Uh, th we're we're, we're going to still have this problem. Now, th now the problem is that the, the vendors <laughs> of these systems uh, are, are more than happy to create that one, yes. one uh, click thing for you, for your <laughs> yes, system, that's right. if you're willing to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, because right. you're, you're, you're the only work with anyone else's. <laughs> and you're the only hospital that needs yeah, that, yes, right? Right, right, right. right. And, yeah. and uh, b because the, the, the federal requirements uh, for uh, electronic health records don't require that to be Not a yet. standard part of every a vendor's package. And but that's it is now part of the latest upgrade in Epic, and Epic has like 52% of the market. So I, hey, and that's, I, that's I think, a hopeful sign. Yes, and yeah. I think personal technology. So, I mean, you can download things onto your phone. Some yeah. of them are set up so that an EMS person can access it even past your, you, you know, they don't have to log into your phone. So, I mean, those are the kinds of things that are going to be helpful because we are, 
as a clinician, we are looking for any yeah. hint of what yeah. you wanted. Honestly, we want to accommodate you. So yeah. if you have any way of communicating that to us, we're going to take it. My, my advance directive <laughs> and my family's uh, are, are all on our, yes, our cell on phones our phone. on, my a, <clears throat> on an app that they can, uh, if I'm, if I'm uh, knocked out and in a hospital here, my son and, and Madison uh, could, could fax it or email it yeah. uh, uh, directly in a, in a couple what, what app buttons. is that? Do you know what it's called? The app? Uh, well, it's an app that's going to go through a change. It's called My Healthcare Wishes, which is an app that we uh, 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 came out with a couple of years ago. But uh, that is uh, going to be replaced by a, a, a new app, app called uh, Mind Your Elders. Uh, probably <laughs> but there are a number of these. Yes. But there are others out okay. there. Yeah. So, so a good role for technology. Well, we've reached the end of our time, unfortunately. Um, thank you all for your attention. Thank our panelists for their expertise. All right, have a good evening.